Zora Smeltzen here, and today we're going to be talking about the synthesizer known as being the mother of all samplers, the Fairlight CMI. This thing has made its appearances all over, including Sesame Street in 1983, where it was demonstrated by Herbie Hancock, who was a big fan of this machine. There was something about it on David Letterman in 1984, and it's been used by countless musicians, including Kate Bush, Duran Duran, Peter Gabriel, The Smiths, among many others. Let's check this thing out. Let's go back in time into 1970s Australia, when Kim Reary, a teenager at the time, was inspired to develop an analog synthesizer to be called the ETI 4600 for his family's magazine, Electronics Today International. He got frustrated with the limited amounts of sounds it could produce. He hit up his old classmate, Peter Vogel, and asked him if he would be interested in working together. Let's make the world's greatest synthesizer, he said, and let's base it on the recently announced microprocessor. He recalled, we had long been interested in computers. I built my first computer when I was about 12, and it was obvious to me that combining digital technology with music synthesis was the way to go. In December of 1975, the two formed a small business to manufacture digital synthesizers. They got the name Fairlight from a memory of when Riri's grandmother lived right by the Sydney Harbor, and the hydrofoil ferry called Fairlight would pass by on a regular basis. So they planned to design a digital synthesizer that could create sounds reminiscent of acoustic instruments. This is also known as physical modeling synthesis. The waveform of the sound to be generated is computed using a mathematical model, a set of equations, and algorithms to simulate a physical source of sound. Anyway, they initially planned to make an analog synth that was digitally controlled, given that they found the competing synthesizer difficult to control. Fast forward to 1976. They're busy doing their thing, and they come across Motorola consultant Tony Furse. How they came into contact with him isn't exactly clear, but they managed to create a synthesizer using Motorola 6800 microprocessors and the wonderfully common light pen, which is a computer input device in the form of a light-sensitive wand using in conjunction with a computer's tube display first used in 1955. This unusually cool combination provided the synthesizer options that had never been thought of before. The first developed model with Tony First was supposedly sterile and inexpressive as the machine was only able to produce harmonic partials. Determined to shape their vision into reality, they tweaked the instrument significantly and determined that they needed to somehow replicate the sound of real instruments into their synthesizers. Over the next year, the duo made what Riri called a research design which was supposedly bulky, expensive, and unmarketable. By 1978, Vogel and Riri managed to have the synthesizer to produce interesting but unrealistic sounds. Still hoping to synthesize the sound of a real instrument by studying the harmonics of instruments, Vogel recorded about a second of a piano piece from a radio broadcast. He discovered that by playing the recording back at different pitches, it sounded much more realistic than a synthesized piano. He recalled in a 2005 interview that they needed to rapidly drop the synthesizer sounds, just take the short excerpts of real instruments and just whack them in the memory bank and away you go. Fiona, this is the last time. Nigel, no! Yes! Ah! Clump. Well, whatever you thought of the play, the sound effects were pretty good. 
And in the early days of radio drama, we went to enormous lengths to get realistic sound effects. But then we learned how to record sound. And instead of a simulated farmyard, say, well, we could have the real thing. <laughs> But we've never been very good at electronically creating sounds that sound real. Listen to this. Well, that synthesizer is supposed to sound like a timpani drum. But does it sound like one? Well, judge for yourself. This is what a timpani drum sounds like. But now, cock an ear to this. It's a synthesizer too. And this is what it sounds like. Well, that's almost perfect, isn't it? And the reason it can create that sound so perfectly is because it's hooked onto a computer, which has mathematically worked out the incredible complexity of the sound wave that a timpani makes. This is how the term sampling was coined by Rory and Vogel. They were literally sampling little sounds of real instruments to play on the synthesizer as you please. They figured that part out, and they also managed to add on the controls for attack, sustain, decay, and vibrato, which to some people was plenty of control, and to others quite limited, as there were incredibly intricate synthesizers like the Moog out there with gigantic boards that could shape tones practically to infinity. By 1979, the two started producing the first series of the Fairlight CMI, which was almost identical to that initial design, except they added a keyboard. No, not another set of musical keys, but a computer keyboard, as well as a large box that stored the sampling, processing, hardware, and the 8-inch floppy disk, which stored all the sounds. But they faced one problem. It could only play half to one second of sound per note. Another criticism is that it would be supposedly too difficult to use for the average user, but it still drew a lot of attention from Australian distributors, and at this point it was even featured in some of the BBC's science-oriented TV shows like Tomorrow's World. The most displeased with the product was the Musicians' Union, who railed against the Fairlight and even called it a lethal threat towards its members, as it was capable of emulating real instruments. 1979 was also the year that Peter Gabriel was recording his third studio album. Vogel visited Gabriel's home in the summer of 1979, where his third solo studio album was being recorded to show him the Fairlight CMI. Gabriel, as well as everyone else present in the studio, was instantly engrossed by it. So, Peter Gabriel was actually the first person to own a Fairlight CMI, and he loved it so much that he even collaborated with one of his recording engineers to distribute the product in the UK for £12,000 a piece. The first person to actually buy a Fairlight CMI was Led Zeppelin bassist John Paul Jones. Bose Burrell of King Crimson and Bad Company followed, then Kate Bush, Geoff Downs of Yes in Asia, Trevor Horn, the one and only Alan Parsons, Rick Wright of Pink Floyd, and Thomas Tolby, the guy who did She Blinded Me with Science. American users include Todd Rundgren, Joni Mitchell, Stevie Wonder, and Jan Hammer, who did the Miami Vice theme. The second edition of the Fairlight CMI came out in 1982, which was considered to be more high quality. It was used for a popular sound called the Orchestra Stab, Orc 5, and the breathy Vox in hip hop, drum and bass, techno, and other genres that were popping up in the 1980s. The page R sequencer was added, which allowed you to graphically edit notes from left to right, like digitally editable sheet music. The third series, released in 1985, included a stylus that didn't require you to hold a light pen onto the screen the whole time and prevented a whole bunch of arm aches. Around that time, sales started to diminish due to the rising costs of units, as well as the competition from the Atari ST, and they quickly went out of business. All that being said, I think this thing is awesome, and I want one. <laughs> so if anyone has one of these things sitting up in the attic, feel free to drop me a line. Has anyone ever used one of these? If so, let me know in the comments, and if you're new, subscribe to our channel and follow along as our band Dream Machine works on recording and producing our new album using the Tascam 3D8. And we'll see you on the next video.